Welcome everyone to this, the second in our Science for Development webinar series, with which we aim to celebrate noteworthy young scientist projects from this year's event and aim to inspire future young scientist projects to have a social and climate justice focus. My name is Aaron Towers and I'm part of South Africa's global citizenship education team. And we, along with our partners, Irish Aid, have the privilege each year of facilitating the Science for Development Award at the BT Young Scientist. And every year we are inspired by the wealth of innovation contained in the projects and the depth of understanding students demonstrate of real challenges facing the most vulnerable of the world's communities and ecosystems. In this way, we are aligned with the UN Global Goals, tasked with assisting the most vulnerable first and to leave nobody behind. So let's get started to the focus of this webinar, which is the BT Young Scientist category for chemical, physical, and mathematical sciences. We aim for each of these panel discussions to have a student from the last Young Scientist exhibition, as well as a past winner of the Science for Development Award, and also a working scientist from our programs in Africa and beyond. So today, we are lucky enough to have Emma Burgess from Wesley College in Dublin. Hello to Emma. Hello, it's great to meet you all. Great, Emma, brilliant. And we will come to your project, which has a, a focus on artificial intelligence and, and mosquitoes shortly. We also have with us uh, today our award winner from 2016, Ruri Jordan. Hi, how's it going? Guru is part of a group project researching into water evaporation or the prevention of water evaporation using polymers and now studying human health and disease at Trinity College. Yeah, just finished there uh, Monday. So we just finished. Yeah. Well, congratulations, I, I, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank we'll you. Find out. Um, and then finally, from our programs team, we have Paul Wagstaff. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for inviting me to this. Paul is the head of our global technical advisory and research team. Thanks to you all in the panel for making time for this. So per perhaps by way of introduction, can I go to you, Paul, first? And maybe could you just tell us what it entails when you are the head of the global technical advisory and research team? <laughs> I could give you the honest answer, which is a lot of administration. <laughs> I know, Paul, uh, we're trying to inspire here. Really. So, but yes, uh, the inspirational side, it is being able to put research into practice. That's what gets me out of the bed every day, is the opportunity to work with researchers around the world, whether it's researchers in Africa, researchers in Ireland, and of course, the students from the, the Beta Young Scientist, and look at opportunities to put you know, science, which is often quite theoretical at the university level, into practice in the field. I see myself as a sort of a, a knowledge broker. So I'm you know, sh swapping ideas around what has worked in Kenya. Will it work in Malawi? An idea from the beta young scientists, is it going to work in Burkina Faso? So that's, that's my role. I'm the middleman. And I know it has involved over the years traveling to many of the program countries many, many times. Indeed. Um, so as South South Africa, we're now working in 20 countries, um, we, uh, all the way from Brazil to Bangladesh, but mostly in Africa. Our core has been agriculture, agriculture and livestock. Um, we've got some very interesting research projects in agriculture and livestock, working with universities in, in Ireland uh, and, and Africa. We work in water, water supply and <laughs> sanitation some really large projects now, particularly in West Africa and Malawi. And another core issue is nutrition. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, we assume that if you grow the food, that'll contribute to addressing the, uh, the chronic malnutrition issues, but it's not so simple. We have to make sure we have the right nutrients in the crops, we have the right balance of nutrients in the diet, we're not losing the nutrients when we prepare the food, when we store it, but also that the food is safe. There's nothing contaminating the food in the food chain. and uh, You've probably all heard about it. One of the current buzzword is now sustainable food systems. We had the UN Sustainable Food Systems Summit last year. The Irish government was probably one of the first governments in the world to produce its 
its position paper, its strategy paper on how Ireland will develop a sustainable food system. And uh, I think that's really the core to our work, is how do we deliver nutritious, safe and affordable food to everybody? Research, I think, has a very important role to play in this. Wow, that's a great, great overview of uh, all the different work and the challenges being faced by communities. Emma, if I can go to you now, uh, you, you may well have met Paul there briefly uh, in Dublin back in March when we had our Science for Development showcase and the Minister for International Development was there. How, how was that experience of the showcase for you? Uh, well, I found it was really great to be able to talk with other uh, people who'd worked on slightly similar projects to me and to like gain insight from them because the BT Young Scientist was uh, online this year due to COVID-19, it was so much uh, better to be able to meet in person and uh, have all our ideas in a kind of melting pot to, you know, uh, talk over with each other and discuss how we could improve our own projects through other people's insights. Yeah, glad that you got to meet some like-minded uh, students uh, in person, like you say. Brilliant. And so to, to Rory there, um, as the winner of the Science for Development Award uh, back in 2016, you got to go on a study visit to one of our programmes, and this meant for you to go to Malawi. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what stands out from that experience? You know, I had huge expectations for it, and honestly, it exceeded all of those expectations by a mile. I suppose one memory would probably be when we went to speak at the uh, university. We ended up traveling a few hours and we were traveling by bus. And, you know, it would seem kind of like a normal mundane thing, but just the world was so different looking at it. We were traveling through what I would describe anyway, in my Irish experience as desert, straight into things that looked like, looked to me as a 16 year old as rainforest. And it was just the ecosystems and everything were just incredible, like nothing I'd ever seen before. Unfortunately, the last uh, few winners of our award haven't had the opportunity to, to take up the study visit be, because of lockdowns and restrictions, but we're hoping that in the uh, near future that there will be the option for a, a similar experience, um, which at 16 must have been, uh, like you say, quite an eye-opening one. Oh yeah, absolutely. Changed, changed a lot of my outlooks on everything, to be honest. It was really, really impactful. That's great to hear. So we've been around the panel. So let's now go uh, in detail into our Young Scientist project of Emma's. So Emma's title for her project was, or is identifying vector-borne diseases using neural networks. You describe your research further by stating uses of artificial intelligence to identify whether an insect could potentially be a vector carrier of diseases. I wonder, Emma, can you explain some of these terms to us, such as vector-borne disease and neural networks? Yeah, uh, so a vector-borne disease is a type of disease that's transmitted by carriers uh, such as parasites like mosquitoes or ticks. They contain a disease uh, like malaria, which transmits the pathogens from uh, person to person. Uh, instead of a typical disease, which you would transmit from person to person without the need of a vector carrier. They transmit it by uh, generally sucking on the blood of a person and the, their saliva gets into the bloodstream. So they're responsible for like uh, 700,000 deaths annually and they're part of 17% uh, of infectious diseases worldwide, according to the World uh, Health Organization. Neural network. Uh, which is how I what I use to uh, identify these uh, vector-borne diseases. It's a type of uh, artificial intelligence um, which kind of teaches a computer a given task by using um, many different training examples. So in this case, I kind of processed a bunch of images of mosquitoes, ticks, and triatomine and other types as well. Uh, converted them to pixels and changed the data around a bit so that the computer could eventually uh, recognize what kind of pixels were typical for um, disease carrying uh, insect types. They kind of like bias on the pixels to say, oh, if it has a wing, it's more likely to be a disease carrying insect rather than like, let's say a picture of a cat, which doesn't have any wings. I see. 
what stands out for us is that you're doing a, uh, research on a problem that really isn't necessarily one that you would experience in Ireland. So how did you come up with this as a project focus? Because mosquitoes and malaria, I, I imagine, is maybe not something you personally ha have experience of, but maybe you do. Uh, well, actually, my uh, grandmother and mother, they both lived in Zambia when, they, uh, when my mom was around 10 or 11, and they both contracted malaria at that time. But because we were like privileged enough to have access to that key healthcare and tests, uh, they didn't have any problem and they don't have any significant difficulties as a result of this. But I was um, thinking about how some people may not be able to access these key tests and resources to help themselves cope with these diseases. So um, I just decided to work from home and see if I could uh, get a solution for that that would be more accessible to people who can't access these kind of things at a smaller cost. Now that I, that's really well put uh, and and that's really what uh, our work is about and and it, this is a science uh, focused webinar and, and we're talking about science for development but it's not science for the sake of, of uh, writing papers and looking it has to be accessible it has to be affordable and it has to work uh, for the people that are in most need of it so like you say for for malaria uh, and, and these air, rural areas, which I'm sure Paul can talk of um, in great detail, and I'm sure Ruri has experience of through his uh, recent studies. So it'd be great if the, you can add in, in anything to Emma's points there. So there's the jump there, Emma. How how does what what your um, research into computer learning and image recognizing um, how could that be accessible or a, a, an understandable uh, to people that, who already don't have access to adequate health care? The idea is um, there's still a large people, uh, a large percentage of people in developing countries that would have access to um, devices like phones, so they would have access to a camera. So the idea is to uh, take a picture of the disease carrying insect and then uh, an app would be hopefully downloaded onto the phone that could um, be able to work through the neural network and uh, run it through and pinpoint if it is a disease carrying insect or not for people who don't have the knowledge to differentiate between the different uh, insects. And hopefully this will be able to pinpoint kind of clusters of disease carrying insects. So um, disease health and control organizations will be able to look at areas and say, this is an area of concern that I need to work on so that we can stop an outbreak before it potentially happens. Sounds sounds really interesting. And it, it's a really good point as well that um, the, the access to mobile phones, um, even basic mobile phones, uh, or and now more and more smart phones, internet um, capable, is really transforming the, the access people have to information and the access to share it, which is like you're saying. So you end up with this citizen scientists where people can uh, wherever they are no matter how rural it is uh, they can take photos uh, and often get online and send them and and have these different sort of early warning uh, systems and things there has been uh, recently enough and probably ongoing and Paul maybe can tell us about locusts swarms uh, across various parts of Africa uh, and I think Pakistan um, and again, knowing where the locusts are and where they're moving, uh, where they've just landed, it, it's nearly impossible to tell. Uh, but if you have people with phones everywhere, they can identify where they are, where they've just been, where they, which way they're going, uh, as an example. And there are many other examples of using phones uh, uh, for medical uh, uh, help and assistance so that's great so very briefly emma do you, i know you just said to us earlier that you're actually in six year uh so do you have do you see any scope or plans for the future with the project that you um started well hopefully after uh, my exams i want to uh, finish the training of the system because i didn't have enough computational power at the time to train on every single image 
but because I had uh, collected such a large database by um, putting on like different filters on the images, um, I still had enough to train it to a, a decently high accuracy. So I hope to apply for access to a high enough uh, computational power source so that I can finish the training. And then uh, eventually I want to work on like developing an app that will be used for access or potentially a website as well so that um, more people could access it um, all over the place uh, as long as they have a phone a camera app or something like that. Brilliant. Uh, I don't know, um, uh, Paul, uh, in particular, if you want to come in on anything that Emma mentioned there. I mean, I, I, I think it's an absolutely fantastic project. I was really amazed when I met Emma at the um, at Ivy House, um, because this is exactly the kind of work we're doing. I mean, it's, uh, it's just, it really is the zeitgeist. It is what everybody's looking at at the moment, and particularly the, the approach you're taking is an approach that you know I'm working with um, ATB in Potsdam, which is one of Germany's leading uh, technology universities, on doing exactly what Emma is doing. So we're using this approach to detect insect pests in um, olives, pineapples, and mangoes, and I'll talk a little about a little bit about that later on. But you know, there's so many potential uses for Emma's work, and you know, there's a lot of little a lot of really interesting um, uses for it. I mean, just on mosquitoes themselves. Each mosquito has a slightly different niche in the uh, in the ecosystem. They nest, you know, they rest on different surfaces. Um, and one of the problems that public health people have is, you know, most people don't wouldn't understand this. A mosquito is a mosquito is a mosquito. Um, but each mosquito will transmit very different diseases, some transmit malaria, others transmit Zika, dengue, Rift Valley fever, and it's understanding the ecology of these mosquitoes that then helps you develop your plan for managing the disease. So I could see, and if you have, if you can get your app working, but public health workers can be using it to um, scan mosquitoes, which are say resting on the wall. And so we know which species those are and which species, sorry, which uh, diseases they're likely to, to be vectors of and therefore do you need to spray this particular wall with uh, a residual insecticide in order to reduce the risk of disease spread. So there's a lot of really, really practical uses for this. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, uh, Paul. Um, Rory, I don't know, uh, maybe because of your, you just finished a degree in, in human health and disease, um, I imagine You've come across uh, something similar to, to Emma's work, have you, with use of smart technology? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that, again, just to echo Paul said, that is exactly where everybody's going with, with kind of research and that kind of thing. And I think one of the big applications is, like, as we all know, the climate is always changing, but it's changing at a faster rate now. And, you know, mosquitoes, they're not trees. They're not going to stay where they are. I think kind of being able to identify those patterns of, you know, how they're spreading through different ecosystems in the same way you might identify desertification, you might notice that a malarial strain of mosquitoes is um, starting to enter a certain climate or a certain ecosystem. So I think being able to track those um, specific species of mosquitoes would be really useful in kind of taking the appropriate steps for preventative measures and everything like that. So I think, you know, it's widely applicable. And I think because it's so quick, I think that that's going to be key to, um, Usually, any public health response, I think speed is usually one of the huge confounding factors. Yeah, so you can see lots of uses there, Emma. You're, you're onto something, maybe. Who knows? Uh, and the part of this webinar is not just looking at the BT Young Scientists, but looking to inspire students and young people that are into science to consider science for development and see the different uh, areas of study and, and careers that are, are available to two students. Maybe um, Rory, uh, we can take you down uh, memory lane here. Uh, we have a short video of, of clips from the 2016 Young Scientist of Exhibition, including you and your team getting uh, the awards, the Our Science for Development Awards. So we might just play this two minutes and then we'll get your uh, memories of it. I 
current project uh, deals with taking harvested rainwater and filtering it through sphagnum moss. It reduces the hardness in the water and it also cleans the water. We think this would be really beneficial considering the amount of water borne disease is present. Our system has the potential to be completely renewable and sustainable. It can run on renewable energy. So we were looking if we could produce biofuel from grass clippings. They create fuel using corn and uh, sugarcane, but that impacts on the world's food supply. With developing countries, a lot of people are going without food and we wanted to see if there was another method that wouldn't impact on that supply. Uh, the calorific value was 1.49 kilojoules per gram, and so the energy value of the manure briquettes was much higher than the turf. Reducing infant mortality, reducing the risk of famine, scaling up nutrition, science can provide the solutions to these great questions. Winners are Rory Jordan, Ben Conlon and Mason Scallon from Sales and College, Southwest Canada. That, that must uh, that must have been quite a, a thrill. Oh, it was absolutely. I mean, to be honest, at the time, I didn't even know the implications of winning the prize. At the time, all I knew was, you know, that I that I'd won this prize. That that kind of my work was to some value in terms of development. So I was just really happy about that at the time. Let's hear a little bit about the project that won and and resulted in you going to Malawi. The title was Preservation of Water Supplies Using hygroscopic polymers yeah so can you tell me uh, or us a bit more about this project because and also how you developed from i, I saw that originally you were looking at flooding in ireland and then yeah. you ended up looking at arid areas of africa so how did that happen yeah i mean i feel like that leaves it that's kind of almost more glamorous than how it actually started it started at looking at nappies you know, hygroscopic polymer sounds great and uh, sodium polyacrylate sounds even better. Realistically, that's just the um, the chemical that's found in nappies that soaks up water. And I saw, you know, how much that bulks up when it uh, encounters water and how it kind of creates a solid layer. So I think we we're having really bad flooding around that year in Ireland. So the initial idea was, you know, filling up sandbags with sodium polyacrylate, which would be obviously a lot lighter because it soaks up the water uh, to make up the bulk of the sandbag. That was kind of the idea. Didn't really pan out because... The rate, of the rate of absorption wasn't quite fast enough to, you know, pro provide meaningful uh, water resistance. I mean, I, I still think there probably could be some kind of way, but I suppose then I just started looking at, you know, transporting water uh, with sodium polyacrylate um, because, you know, water is very hard to transfer or to transport. Uh, so logistically, it's quite difficult. I was kind of looking at the benefits of how that would work. And I found the biggest benefit we'd have would be the prevention of evaporation. So because the uh, sodium polyacrylate likes to hold on to the water so much, it stops it from evaporating. After doing a bit more digging, I found out that um, evaporation of water is a huge issue. And um, that's almost taken as a given in many parts of the world. At the time, I think they were just starting to combat it in Australia and California, where they're using these um, shade balls um, to prevent, uh, prevent evaporation. But there was actually studies coming out at the time and that these shade balls were actually breaking down into carcinogenic uh, chemicals. And um, so they weren't really optimal. And that opportunity to use sodium polyacrylate, which was just, you know, environmentally inert, had no toxic byproducts to preserve water in kind of a bit, bit of a safe way. That was kind of the, the premise of it. So, yeah, essentially the project was just, uh, you know, adding water to sodium polyacrylate, uh, weighing it, uh, heating it with a heat lamp. And kind of seeing how much evaporated, how much water was actually lost versus a control, which was just, you know, regular water. And so just to, so we can visualize this, when we, you're talking about these polymers, these are like little balls, little gels uh, that can expand and hold the water. So and then, and then you can get the water out again. The kind I used was, was a powdered form. So that allowed me to form, you know, a contiguous layer of water rather than having like 
essentially spheres aren't going to tessellate so well. So there's going to be gaps between and you're going to have kind of issues there. But if you just add this, it basically solidifies the whole uh, body of water. It's essentially like freezing the water without the need of actually freezing it. Ah. It's kind of the, the simplest way to put it, I feel. In order to retrieve the water, um, adding salt actually just breaks the bonds between the water and the sodium polyacrylate because of the sodium. Um, basically, uh, and then, then you end up with salt water, which again, not ideal, but kind of our workaround at the time was, you know, looking at using solar desalination, kind of using heat to evaporate water and recondense it um, from the sun, basically. Um, so it was essentially an electricity free way of having frozen water, uh, salt water, and then clean water. I mean, it's a bit convoluted in practice, but, you know, the theory was definitely there. Oh, it's uh, really interesting. And, you know, like you say, you know, maybe in practice, uh, there's other, you come up with other challenges and, and, and whatever have you, but the, all, these, all these techniques that you're talking about, things, something that is solar powered, uh, electric free, uh, doesn't require refrigeration, all these, all these things that are uh, not accessible. Uh, and, and also very input heavy for lots of regions of the world. Uh, we can't have solutions that rely on regular uh, electricity um, and we need to reduce our demand uh, globally anyway. So all these, all these sort of, like say, coming up with answers to uh, problems, uh, but again, that they have to be uh, non-polluting and accessible and affordable and, and using renewables even just as a, a as a exploration so when you went to malawi and went to the university what was the response to to your your research uh, when you presented it at the university i think i think the biggest response we really got was that you know evaporation as i said is taken as a given you, you know what i mean um so people are always concerned about you know cleaning the water you have and you know sourcing water and everything like that and the evaporation of water especially in warm countries obviously it is not really seen so much as a present uh, or a preventable factor so i think a lot of people were it's not so much they wanted to do this exact idea but that they kind of saw this is something that can be tackled and that would you know make a meaningful difference in water supplies in areas prone to drought because the amount lost to evaporation is actually colossal isn't it yeah it's um I believe it's 80% of lost water in Africa and something like 50 in, in the continent of Asia, as far as I'm aware now. Um, those, those figures are obviously quite outdated now because it's been a while since I've been up to date on all of that. It is preventable. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of ways that it is preventable. And I think that the reality of the sodium polyacrylate versus the shade balls they were using is sodium polyacrylate is just a chemical. It's just something you add to your water, whereas these shape balls, they're, they're manufactured so and they're very difficult to transport and they're bulky. So you're going to again run into logistical issues and cost issues, whereas sodium polyacrylate is really, really cheap or was at the time. I don't know if it's supply chain now, but. Yeah, you've ended up going on to Trinity and studying human uh, disease uh, or human health, is it, and disease. Um, it's good to get the health in there, not just not just the sickness. Uh, so, and so I, I imagine there was some sort of connection with, uh, or influence was there from your BT young scientist experience and going to Malawi, influencing what you studied in Trinity. Oh yeah, I mean, I suppose you know there was. I was probably always going to go for science. I was kind of somebody who was predisposed to it, and um, all along. But I mean, specifically once I actually got into the group into the into the degree and um, I, I took a much greater interest in kind of you know microbial um infection so you know micro microbiology and everything so i elected to do my final year project this year on a gene editing editing technique in e coli you know there's there's boundless amounts of human disease and health factors and everything out there you know there's autoimmunity cancer and everything like that but i kind of always gravitated towards you know these microbial diseases um I think a huge amount of that is based on, you know, what I saw in Africa. You know, in Ireland, we take those as kind of, oh yeah, it's grand. I'll treat it with some antibiotics and, you know, I'll just chlorinate the water, everything like that. But realistically, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. You know, you need to be able to refine these solutions and just make better solutions that are more efficient and 
cost effective and everything like that I, I personally just gravitated towards that because i kind of i saw the reality of it whereas a lot of people i suppose who they just they wouldn't think it was worth their time because they'd be like oh yeah you go to the gp and you get some antibiotics uh -huh. yeah yeah true true okay so wonderful thanks thanks for all that uh, Rory. um so finally let me go to paul uh and i, I know in in your work with self-help africa and and united purpose that you're coming across innovations and and research all the time and you've mentioned already sort of connection to mosquitoes and and other pests and i think you mentioned also the the pressures on water and the uh, efficient use of it can you describe some of uh, of the programs and challenges uh, that you're currently uh, involved in sure thank you very much for that yes yeah, so i'll try and link these to uh to the ai idea yeah ai is the cutting edge at the moment um so we were working with uh, a spin-off from ucd there was a Caterpillar that arrived in Africa from South America in 2016. And as an invasive species, it spread very rapidly across Africa and it really hit maize. I mean, it, it was it was for very hungry caterpillar. It went through every maize field in Africa and it looked like a plague, a plague from a Bible. The impact on maize fields was so dramatic, you could see it from a car window as you drove past. So we thought, well, if you know, if we can see this from a car window, surely we can see this from a satellite image. So um, we have a grant from the Gates Foundation. We worked with a, a spin-off company from UCD who had the AI. They were using a, a random version of random forest, random forest algorithm, um, to see if we could find this caterpillar, the full army worm in Maysfield in Malawi from satellite images. So uh, as Emma did, we had to develop a, a lot of images of what's called the learning data sets. So you know, we, uh, we went out into fields in Malawi, we recorded whether this pest of wall army worm was there or not, uh, and the, <laughs> the coordinates for it, so we could then find this field on the satellite image, and we could look at the color of the image and say, well, this is the color of a field with wall army worm, this is the color of a field which is free of it. It takes a huge amount of images, I mean, we use thousands and thousands, and <laughs> the advantage with an AI uh, algorithm like Render Forest is it learns. So you use the, uh, some of the images to train it, and then you use some of the images as the test. And you show it a photograph of a field from a satellite, and you say, you know, does this have full line room in it or not? And if it gets it right, great. If it gets it wrong, you say, you get the algorithm to do it again and again. And it takes, you know, several thousand cycles. And eventually we were getting up to 80% accuracy. So from a satellite, you could spot the caterpillar in the maize field in Malawi with 80% accuracy, <laughs> which we were really, really impressed with. Um, so that's one really practical example of this. So this way we could now track how this caterpillar was spreading across Africa and which areas you needed to treat to avoid just, you know, everybody spraying every field. You don't need to do that. You only need to spray the hotspots. So, a similar approach, we work with Penn State University in the US uh, with on a, an AI-based app for a smartphone. You basically take a photograph of uh, your cassava plant with your phone, and the app will say whether it has a virus in it. Uh, virus diseases are a major issue for, for cassava. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in Kenya trying to produce um, varieties of cassava which are resistant and stocks of cassava which are virus free and this uh, smartphone app has made a huge difference now because if farmer if a farmer can find a cassava plant with viruses in her field she can uproot and she can destroy that plant before it has a chance to affect the rest of the field so you know it's it's really working well in the field you know i think for emma's work when i saw it i mean it just <laughs> It's exactly the same as another project we have in, in West and North Africa, which is the one I mentioned. We're working with uh, researchers in Finland and Germany. Um, so we're looking to develop an AI-based app for detecting insect pests in olives, mangoes, and pineapples. So the idea for this is we have um, sticky traps in the fields, uh, which is basically a sheet of paper with a, a glue on it that that won't dry. Um, and also if insects flying around in the field will get stuck on it, just like fly paper. It's not, it's not very, very low tech. Um, so then you can photograph the insects on the on the fly paper. You can use those, you build use those to build up the learning library for the AI algorithm. 
And then once we've developed the algorithm, we can then, the farmers can be using these sticky traps in the field, then they only need to scan the sticky trap with their phone and they'll know which, which pests are in the field. So, um, so yeah, yeah, if I could put you Emma, in contact with our researchers in Helsinki and Potsdam, um, they can certainly share all the, the tricks of the trade in how to uh, develop your algorithm. And I'm um, sure they could help you with the computing power you need as well. Thank you very much. That sounds like a really great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And something that uh, Rory said, but to uh, grab my attention, I think this is really, really important, is um, Rory said, well, here in Ireland, when you're sick, you go to the doctor and you get an antibiotic. R Rory can tell you more than me is an utter disaster. <laughs> Um, because everybody goes to the doctor and they get antibiotic, uh, we have a real problem with resistance to antimicrobials. So it's not just antibiotics, it's antifungals, it's dewormers. And, you know, we could have technologies like this and we have, you know, a constant issue with resistance to antimalarials. Uh, as Rory said, you know, people aren't looking at the mosquitoes, they're just assuming you've got a fever, therefore you have malaria, therefore take this. And, you know, it's, it's a real struggle. I mean, I think, to be honest, pharmaceutical companies are losing the race to develop antimalarials faster than the mosquito develop resistance. Now, we do have a vaccine, which is looking really, really promising, but the history of vaccines for malaria is one that's been fraught with promises which haven't delivered because it's really, really complicated. Something I'm very concerned about, and I think your app could be really successful for, is PICS. Um, so, obviously, we know... Uh, Malaria spread by uh, mosquitoes, but in my line of work, which is animal health, ticks are the number one vector. Um, ticks are a huge issue for, I mean, they're an issue for animal health here in Ireland, but they're a huge issue in the tropics. Identifying different species of ticks is a, is a challenge, and your, you know, your software can be really useful for that. And uh, you mentioned, uh, again, in Ireland, um, Obviously, 10 years ago, no one had heard of zoonosis. Zoonosis are diseases which jump between animals and humans. Um, now, of course, with COVID, with, uh, with SARS, with MERS, everybody's heard of zoonosis. We're now you know, tracking the insects um, because we are now aware of this, of this huge risk. And you know, one of the things we're looking at in Ireland is the Bhutan disease, which is spread by uh, midges in Ireland. It's a fatal disease of sheep. and it's, this keeps um, Irish microbiologists awake at night because, you know, you can imagine the number of midges in Ireland. <laughs> if blue tongue in sheep jump the species, then we really are in trouble. So uh, I think trying to identify different species of midges would be a challenge for any app, but uh, that's definitely something to think about. So, yeah. <laughs> so thank yes. you, Aaron. Yeah, no, great, perfect. So some, some examples there of... Uh, of possible projects for, for you know building off of what Emma was explaining, but mm -hmm. using uh, you know threats and examples that you could be looking at here in Ireland with looking at ticks, looking at uh, uh, problems with uh, sheep, and then exploring it further. Um, and from from our perspective of science for development, if you wanted your project, even if it was looking at sheep in Ireland and and say ticks in Ireland. If you uh, explored further and wider and, ex and demonstrated how that your research is um, applicable in other regions of the world, it fits the criteria then for science for development, so that you are then looking at global context and other communities that maybe don't have the access to preventative measures or medicines that we sometimes take for granted. And so these innovations can have an even more dramatic effect. And like you say, ticks here are, are, are a issue, um, but in, in um, tropical regions and other areas, uh, the consequences can be a lot more serious. So in, in the few minutes we have left, maybe I can go back to, to Emma and Ruri for, for those that have done the BT Young Scientist, for any tips that you might have for students and teachers looking into doing researches. Uh, research, research projects. So Emma, do you have any uh, piece of advice? I definitely recommend doing a topic that you're really interested in because then when you're working on it, it's a lot more fun and you kind of tend to work a lot harder on things that are kind of like important to you because like 
I'd already been interested in insects because I have to keep feeder insects for my pet lizard. So it was very interesting to me <laughs> to find out if they were um, harmful or not. But um, also, I definitely recommend starting sooner rather than later because, gosh, I really kept it short with the time constraints. <laughs> For the project, I was a bit like running mad around with my computer overheating and <laughs> 24 hours a day. So definitely sooner rather than later for working on it. Very true, always. Um, Rory can probably uh, vouch for that, having just done his finals and probably left it a bit later than he wished, maybe, I don't know. Uh, Rory, have you got any, if you can remember back to 2016, any advice or all the research you've done in the meantime? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, again, from college research as well, but I think I was lucky enough to do the business boot camp up to young scientists as well. So I would have met a lot of people who did, you know, quite well in the, in the event, essentially. And I think the biggest common denominator was that everybody's questions were fantastic and fantastical, and they were just really creative. But you need to keep your experiment, you know, simple. You, 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 find, you find a really good question. And then you find the most efficient and the best way of answering that question and preferably answer that question three times so that you get statistically relevant results. Yeah, I, I find science is kind of more of an art of asking the right questions and kind of figuring what, out exactly what that is and then kind of figuring out the, the simplest way you can do that. And again, that's kind of extended all the way through college. My project supervisor for this uh, Just Gone Thesis project was saying the exact same thing. You know, any project that's done as simply as possible is, you know, ideal. So, you know, don't, don't try to hyperextend yourself doing anything, you know, super technical because, uh, or even just getting in, trying to get into, into the nitty gritty of the science, but just kind of understand the context of your science, understand, you know, the implications of your findings and kind of understand kind of a pretty good roadmap on how to come to the answer of the question, which can be whatever you want. And, you know, preferably something you're interested in, preferably something that, you know, will have an application in the wider world. Yeah. Amazing, brilliant. So I was just thinking there that it's uh, through running these webinars has come uh, more and more evident to me uh, to encourage students and teachers to, to really reach out for support and, and look for advice, you know, while when you're doing your projects to, to ask questions of working scientists to to reach out to in, uh, institutions to university departments and professors. Uh, and to organizations in the field like Self Help Africa. And, and you may well be surprised at the help that is offered, direction to papers and, and techniques, examples, case studies, and even access to equipment. You never know. So I would recommend doing that. I don't know, Paul, if you have any uh, pearl of wisdom? Yeah, I think what you said, Aaron, is really good. I mean, there's actually a lot of... Uh... A lot of scientists in universities and researchers who get really excited by the BT and would love to help you. So, uh, you know, reach out. Uh, we can certainly help you. Definitely some projects this year, but um, I could have given them some equipment. I've got it on the shelf behind me they could have used. <laughs> um, I think it doesn't, you know, I've seen some really amazing high tech stuff. So obviously we have the AI side from Emma um, that Rory mentioned gene editing i remember being blown away several years ago as you know crispr cas had just been invented two students in i think they what what how old were they <laughs> i remember already using crispr cas for the bt young scientists which is unbelievable so there is obviously opportunity for uh, you know the cutting edge of technology but there's also some absolutely wonderful really simple ideas i mean uh, i think Last year, we had some girls who were looking at, well, if we use copper for door handles in hospitals, would it reduce <laughs> cross infections? Uh, we all know copper is an antibiotic. And I thought, well, that's, that's exactly the kind of thing I've needed in an African health center where we can't, you know, people can't afford to keep stocks of disinfectant to wipe the door handles. Something as simple as a copper door handle. You know, Zambia, Zambia is one of the world's biggest copper producers. So, uh, you know, I think there's plenty of opportunities for the low tech as well as the high tech. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. That's a, a really good example uh, to end on. So thanks very much uh, to the panel for your time and your inputs. And thanks for everyone uh, making time to join the, the webinar and in particular to teachers for facilitating classes to join us. That's us for now. Um, thanks for everyone once again. And we will see you uh, in the not too distant future after the summer break 
uh, for the next of these uh, webinar series.